You're listening to the Deep Purple Podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. You know, you mentioned the Deep Purple podcast, legends, great guys. You're listening to the Deep Purple podcast, a fan podcast about one of the most legendary bands of all time, Deep Purple. We take a look at the music, history, and people behind the band Deep Purple and beyond. Welcome to the Deep Purple Podcast, the first and only podcast devoted to one of the greatest bands in rock history, Deep Purple. Today's episode is episode number 234, Pace Ashton Lord Live 1977. And coming to you from the Mushroom Kingdom, right outside Chicago, I'm your host, Nathan Beaudry. And coming to you from the suburbs of Providence, I'm your co-host, John Hotspot Matola. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes, this whole episode on my end is being powered by my phone as I have no internet. Yeah, so the video the video may be a little choppy, but hopefully um, you've got a very specific time when your internet's supposed to be back. And, yes, uh, or I could have been John at 10, 19 a.m. Matola. <laughs> 10 19 it's it's so specific that it makes you wonder why can't they just turn it on now if they know exactly when it's going to be back why don't they just do it now it's like Hmm. um it's like that uh that brian regan bit where he calls the phone company and he and he's and he's like hey i want to set this up and um and he's like when when can you like send a guy a, a, a guy out here to to do it and they're like Oh, oh, yeah, we don't do that anymore. It's very, very high tech, very sophisticated. We just flip a switch on our end and it's done. And he's like, okay, well, c- can you flip it then? He's like, no, we're going to flip it next Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, here we here we are. Yeah. So for, for some reason, I don't know if it's the amount of rain we got, but just there is like mushrooms, wild mushrooms everywhere on everybody's lawn on in the parks all sorts of different crazy mushrooms growing everywhere huge like mario style mushrooms everywhere hmm. i don't know why but I'm, I'm worried that my dog's gonna eat one and die so i'm like wherever we're walking although she doesn't seem interested in them which is weird because it was like if it was goose poop she'd be trying to eat it but mushrooms not <laughs> interested uh yeah, you gotta, well, have pro- gotta have priorities Maybe she's smart enough to stay away. Yeah, well, let's hope. Um, all right, folks. Well, we're doing a live stream here. We got a live show, live stream, as we try to always do at an earlier show. This is Breakfast with the Deep Purple podcast or lunch for our for our UK listeners. So thank you for everybody in the chat. Um, oh, and our, uh, well, we do have um, also Scott Haskin in the chat who's up real early. What is this? It's not even seven o'clock his time. Yep. Wow. Dedication. Dedication. Scott never sleeps Haskin. Exactly. He Haskin no need for sleep. That was terrible. Um, okay, so if you want to support our show, there's a number of ways you can do it. One is by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also buy some merch off our Etsy store, and you can become a patron on Patreon, which gains you access to these exclusive live streams, as well as our patrons-only Discord and our ratings spreadsheet. So if you are interested in that, for as little as $1 a month on Patreon or on PayPal, you can become part of the Hall of Heroes that celebrate this show. You can also donate on Cash App using dollar sign DPPOD or buy us a Kofi on Kofi. Um, only a couple people have done that, I think. So um, we appreciate it. I'm not drinking Kofi though. I'm drinking. I'm drinking hot tea in the morning here. So speaking of our patrons at the executive level, coming in at the in memoriam tier, we have the wonderful Gerald Kelly and his family. At the $25 Uncommon Man tier, we have Ovis Nakvi and Purple Maniac. At the 15 Squid tier, we have Alan. At the $10 Good Doctor tier, we have Mike Catan. Thank you, Mr. Catan. And I think we might have... um forgotten him on the crazy Glenn Hughes episode. So a thousand apologies to Dr. Mike Gattin. We're just going to throw you one more. So 
Thank you very much for that. Sorry if we missed you. That that show was kind of crazy with everything going on with how many people were on it. So I, I apologize. At the turn up to $11 tier, Clay Wambacher, Frank Tealgard Mortensen, Mickelstein, and Will Porter, PhDPP. And at the $10 Someone Came tier, Ryan M., Jeff Bryce, Victor Campos, Better Call Saul Evans. And at the Hughes Oween by 2033 tier, we have Fielding Fowler. I swear it comes in later every time. <laughs> I don't I don't think that's possible, but um, thank you to all of you for your generous support of the show. And um, oh, do I have this ready? Uh, let's see. Speaking, I'm going to I'm going to go old school. But speaking of Apple podcast reviews. Hey, we have a review. Uh, this one is from Fluffy Rug from Australia. Five stars. The title of the review is Five Stars. Fluffy Rug says, if you love Deep Purple music, here's a podcast for you. Sit back and listen to two old chums chewing the fat, discussing all things purple while listening to all the associated purple related projects. There's a lot to get through. So start with a couple of albums that you are familiar with. This will get yourself used to the format and their style of banter. Then slowly work your way back through the episodes. Enjoy. I like that. He kind of wrote a little uh, like a, a how to manual on how to how to do the Deep Purple podcast, which I thought was pretty cool because, um, yeah, I, I think that is a, is a good spot. That's I, I mean, I think a lot of people would do that. They'd say, well, I'm going to check out this podcast. Some people would start with the most recent episode. Some people start with the first episode. Neither of those might be the best way to get into any particular podcast, but find something, a subject you're particularly interested in or an album you're particularly interested in, and then see how you how you like the banter. And if uh, we're just a couple of knuckleheads, mm. you can move on to one of those other Deep Purple podcasts. Oh, no, you can't. We're the only one. You know, I was pretty, I was pretty sure when, you know, when you when you um, wrote that new intro, like, I don't know. 10 episodes in or whatever you're like hi well, how about we call it you say this i was pretty sure that soon there'd be another deep purple podcast but so far we're still the only one well that was my thought behind it was is that we could say the first and only yep so then when there uh, eventually another one shows up we can say the first yeah when when, when all of a sudden been... you're listening and i say the first go, oh my god there's another one and we're going to lose all of our listeners <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I mean, I don't know. That's kind of like that, 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 um, I don't know what you want. It's like a built-in clause or something like that. Like we can be, well, you weren't the first. Oh no, no. Go back and listen. We said the first and only. See? Yeah, that's right. And yep. still whatever episode, and if, if we make it to five years, that's pretty, pretty impressive that nobody else on this earth has decided to try this <laughs> yet, but it's certainly that's, not that's fine a, because we're just doing it so amazingly. <laughs> <laughs> oh god we couldn't top those guys <laughs> see well scott tried scott tried what oh he tried to take me down see yes and they in the in the chat he says he tried to take us down but um occasional episodes aren't going to do it scott that's like uh david and goliath so <laughs> yeah <laughs> you need to go over to a full <laughs> deep purple format well if scott did do it though he'd do like nine episodes a week and we would just like crumble under the pressure he'd be He'd be at, you know, we're, we're at what? We're episode 234. He'd be at episode 240 by in two weeks in. And he'd be, he'd surpass what he's like. He'd be like the Deep Purple podcast with the most episodes. <laughs> Damn it. That's true. That's true. He would, he would beat us in terms of sheer volume. Yep. So. Yeah. All, all, well, we could cheat. We could just split up all of our episodes into like 10 episodes. Like. Oh yeah. We could, we could pull a Haskin and like. Uh, yeah. Pace. Just. Pace Ashton use, Lord use live his own thing against part him. eight <laughs> in this five minute segment. <laughs> I mean, I've been on shows like I've been on, on Scott's show where he's we've talked so long, which we always do. Yes. That he's got to break it up into like four episodes. And by like the, the third, I'm just like, damn it. We recorded that a long time. I don't even remember this. I think the first <laughs> I don't know if it was the first time I was on. Well, it was I think it was made by the first time I was on his show solo. Uh, we talked about one song by Uriah Heep and it was three parts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was a long oh. song, to be fair, but um, hmm. OK, so, um, yeah, thank you to Fluffy Rug. But of course, the question that you're all asking is. 
is that the 100th episode? Because as you know, when we get to um, the 100th uh, review, rather, 100th Apple uh, podcast review of, of five stars. That's what I'm asking. We're going to you ask Axkin Haskin. That's what I'm asking. We are going to uh, send you a Deep Purple podcast goodie bag. So uh, judges, was that the 100th episode? <laughs> 100th review, I should say. Sorry. Oh. Sorry, Fluffy Rug. That was, a, I, it was I wish not it was. the 100th that, review, that was, not episode. Yeah, 100th review. But that was such a good, um, such a good, a, a good, like, tutorial on how to get into the show. I wish it was. But everyone gets a little closer. So keep writing those reviews, folks. Now I feel like we're going to have to have a prize for, like, a 110th review. Well, I guess then people will just be able to <laughs> add it up. <laughs> But um, well, we'll have to do something else to keep people writing reviews because it seems to be um, making people write reviews a little bit more. So thank you for the great reviews, everybody. We really appreciate it. And there's just yeah. one more th- thing to do until we get to the task on hand. And that is, of course, one of our uh, most long lasting and enduring segments. And that's postcards from the edge of Connecticut. This one is coming to us courtesy of, of course, the Gardo. So here we go. We got we got the Gardo. Hey, Um, there it it is. Greetings from Worcester, Massachusetts. I didn't know if it was going to say scenic Worcester and if they were lying. (laughs) (laughs) But um, greetings from Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, This is the postcard that if you listen to our Glenn Hughes episode, I actually watched Pete drop in the mail. Um, So it took eight days to get here, which seems like seems long, Um, but it it did come. It's from uh, it's from the local one of those local vintage uh, postcards. First class mail, U.S. postage paid. Uh, So it says, Nate, great to see you and Glenn in Worcester. Signed Pete, Eddie and Mark. So there you go. And it's got his custom Avery label. Nice. Uh, with my name and address uh, that's got the umlauts over umlauts or circumflexes or lines over every single vowel in my name. Um, I, I wonder how many of these he's pre-printed, how many of these Avery labels. But thank you, Peter. Appreciate getting the uh, the postcard as always. I was I was hoping it would be here for our Glenn Hughes episode, but for some reason, the, the U.S. mail has been a little, little slow on the take on this one. Um, yeah. All right, so here we are. We 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 talked a little bit about, or we played a little bit from this show on our our tribute to Bernie episode, um, and uh, you you were definitely commenting during it, like, "Wow, this is you know this is a really good show. I'd like to, um, you know, we we should we should check it out." And we've been talking about maybe reviewing it since we did the album, which was I don't know, hundred and. 50 episodes ago or however long ago it was because um, yeah. it is a great show. And um, there, there's lots about this particular show. So a few books that I'm going to be referencing um, to get the full the full story of this very, very short lived project is Bernie Marsden. Where's my guitar? And I do have I'm proud to say the, an autographed copy, which is pretty cool. Nice. Um, then we've got, of course, the book, uh, Zermatitis by Tony Ashton, a musician's guide to going downhill fast. Um, and then it has, it even has, has a quote on the back from Ewan McGregor. So I think we've talked about getting Ewan McGregor on the show before to talk about Tony Ashton, cause he's a huge Tony Ashton fan. It would be amazing to have Ewan McGregor on the show and, and only talk about Tony Ashton. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> Just like, ah, oh, yeah, your movies. Uh, but let's get back to Tony Ashton. Um, well, I, I love Neil McGregor. I think, I think he's awesome. He's a great actor. Um, so Zermatitis, uh, The Art of Going da- Downhill Fast. Uh, so this is Tony's a little bit maybe foggy recollection of the events. Then you've got Bernie Marsden's a little more maybe level-headed or clear-headed recollection. And then we've got John Lord, a visual biography uh, by Jerry Bloom, which is a collection of different uh, quotes from interviews and stuff. Um, very short segment in here about about that era, but um, some good stuff there, too. Um, sadly, Ian Pace doesn't have a book. I feel like I feel like Ian Pace should have a book. He's mm. done so much. 
I mean, he could have a book just about Deep Purple, but he could have a second book just about all the side projects he worked on and everything. So, uh, Ian, I if mean, you're... he was he was the guy that was on Shades of Deep Purple. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> he played on that album. <laughs> um, so, so yeah. Um, so, so there's a there's a lot of stuff going into it, but just a few uh, kind of like a little rundown of the of the course of events. Mostly keeping up the pace. A Lord Longford with the uh, with the title for the book. You know, I mean, come on. I like that. This stuff writes itself. Um, pace, if you're listening, we want that book. Just call me. Just call me once a week and. Talk to me about what happened. I'll, I'll write it for you. I don't, I don't care. Um, I just I just want it to exist. So in Zermatitis, um, so Zermatt is one of the mountains in um, in Switzerland. The book is very, if you have, it, it's it's worth reading, but it's very like conversational, like very, like all his like sense of humor. And it's like just the way that he talks. So it's it, in parts, it's like very British and very like, clever and you know he just shows his wit and everything but at some points it's like a little hard to follow like wait what's he saying here uh but it's a really really good one so in zermatitis he um he talks about when they were rehearsing for this tour and this is the tour that we're going to see here and, and and how roger moore was like around and, and he like greeted them as they were going to practice on the soundstage um bernie tells a little bit more about roger moore being there and roger moore being interested they let him into the in to check things out and then he invited them to go watch like the filming of a bond movie whatever bond movie he would have been making at the time it had barbara bach in it so i, I didn't look it up but whatever was being filmed in 1977 um is what uh he would have been working on at the time um so uh, he describes, you know, what we're going to see on the stage. He says uh, about the stage that they set up, John, Ian and I were pride of place at the front of the stage with Ian on a big rostrum. John made John and me faced each other when I wasn't up front, armed with black concert grand pianos and a Hammond organ each. Lordy was a highly elaborate affair incorporating all his synths, clavinets, etc. The awe-inspiring stage structure was snow white punctuated by discreet silver striping. Howie, Casey, and the other horns with Sheila and Jeanette McKinley were up above us on the large platform. Bernie and Paul had their, their dazes, which had ramps, not unlike dry ski runs on which they could pose and canter up and down at will. So we'll see the stage here. It's kind of a, an elaborate affair. Um, uh, Ashton talks about going up to the show, he says, um, he said the night before the show, he was super, super um, uh, having trouble sleeping. He said, even with my usual liquid intake, I couldn't sleep. I was left with my thoughts and agonized again over our ambitious project. Surely most of the fans are going to want Blackmore, Gillen, Coverdale, or Glover to say nothing of Glenn Hughes or Tommy Bolin. Only once had I performed without my organ as a prop. Um... Uh, I really couldn't see myself strutting and sashaying all over this, all over the shop. Um, and then he says, um, I did thrive on new experiences, but being lynched by a howling mob, for instance. <laughs> so he thinks they're going to show up expecting deep purple part two and, and, uh, string him up from the rafters. Um, he talks about magnet, who was one of the deep purple kind of, guys roadies he he refers to him as the brummy deep purple veteran rhododendron so i don't know if he's using roadie as rhododendron i don't know what he's going for with that one um uh, so he says uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, that him and all the guys saw him like before the rehearsal and were like hey are you gonna be okay uh because he looked terrible um john started up playing ghost story and said tony just had like a blinding flash his voice seized up he felt nauseous and he felt like this um a while back when they were in when he was in switzerland playing and he had he said a, a swiss quack had diagnosed him with alcohol related stress and exhaustion and charged him 200 swiss francs um, he said this seemed like the same sort of thing. So he was having some sort of kind of breakdown. Um, said John Lord re recommended a doctor to him. Um, and he said he didn't want to risk his life at the experimental hands of dear old Mike the Psych this time. Um, so not a lot of love for the mental health profession if coming from Tony Ashton. So he got an appointment the next morning and they said uh, it's a little gross. But the doctor said that mucus was sliding down his throat like Niagara Falls. He said his larynx is being drowned. You have to stop smoking. And they ran a liver function test on him. And they said that he was basically in very 
bad shape. Don't eat any fried foods or curries. And then after the tour, come see me. So he tried to follow that advice. He stopped smoking, um, but the condition seemed to get worse. Um, and then they, they did a live TV ap appearance where um, some of the reviews were Ashton was unconvincing and seemed at odds with his musical superiors. Sadly, the band with so much potential was sabotaged by Ashton, who seemed to be in some sort of extraterrestrial orchestra of his own. And then somebody else said, bring back the perps. Um, so he said, Ashton said, morale going into this show here was at an all time low. He said the band seemed to shrug it off, but he was really bothered. So... Um, Ashton, uh, Bernie tells more of like a story of kind of meeting all the guys and, uh, how encouraging and nice Ashton was. He tells a story of going to the pool and cause they're in Germany at the Arabella hotel when they're recording the album and he's at the pool and, um, this German guy comes over and is like, you, sh you swim good. And, uh, he had this like, kind of broken conversation with him in German. And then, you know, in the conversation, he's like, oh, I'm going to. I'm in a rock band. And he said, ah, there is too much of this English rock music in Germany. And he's like, oh, boy, this is not going so well. And then afterwards, the guy said, um, just dropped the accent and said, you must be Bernie Mars and I'm Martin Birch. So it was just Martin Birch having some fun with him, um, which I think is pretty good. Uh, Martin, Martin is a chairman, Birch. Um, yeah, he isn't. Did he have that nickname before? Is <laughs> a chairman. I don't think so. He should have. Um, he said that when he was rehearsing with Ian Pace that like, he, he didn't realize until they actually went into the studio to record. And then when they did the live shows, that Pace during rehearsals was only giving like 50%. Like he was just playing really like calm and everything. And then he went all out when they were on stage and he was blown away by his playing. Um, he said Pace's nicknames were tight wallet, small pockets, or the bank of Pace, uh, for his legend. He said, what did he say? Legendary, uh thriftiness <laughs> um which is funny because i haven't heard about this <laughs> yes you have you've heard about me oh. you, you, you've well maybe you were too drunk that night when we met him. <laughs> rich was talking about it but yeah he's le legendarily he's he's he's, he's tight with the money but which is funny because he bought us drinks when we met him <laughs> he took out that yeah that's what <laughs> huge Thinking. absolutely huge wad of cash and then he left and we didn't realize until afterwards like oh crap he bought us drinks he bought our drinks that was pretty nice that'd be, that'd be funny it would actually have been funnier if he stuck us with the bill <laughs> he's like hey are you guys paying for that guy that just left <laughs> <laughs> i mean i would have gladly paid for ian pace's drink oh god well yeah who knows what his bar tab was at that point though <laughs> I would have gladly helped to pay for Ian yes, Pace's drinks. We could have all. Hey, I would have just for the story. I don't care how much it was. That would have been great. Oh yeah, he stuck us with the uh. bill. That would have been hilarious. Um, <laughs> so he tells the story of, um, and this might not be a, a revelation to any of our UK listeners, but um, <clears throat> uh, Bernie says they they were at this pub, and I guess um, Bernie was like tasked with going to pick up Tony Ashton for rehearsals and for all that sort of stuff. And everyone at the pub loved Tony, so whenever Bernie came in, they'd just be like. Bernie! <laughs> they'd boo Bernie because he was taking Tony away. Um, so <laughs> he said that um, during this uh, thing, there was a there was a, a UK uh, producer named Paul Knight. <clears throat> He's a TV producer, and they were working on a show called The Crez, and uh, they got Tony to write the theme music, and Tony asked Bernie to play on it, and also playing on it were Simon Phillips, who we've talked about a bunch very recently too. Um, and Dave Peacock of Chaz and Dave. So um, so they go into the studio and they record the song. And I thought it would be fun to just listen to uh, the song, the theme from The Crez, which is a funny name for a show for some reason for me. But here we go. This is Tony Ashton, Bernie Marsden, Simon Phillips, and Dave Peacock doing the song for The Crez. <laughs> and he says <laughs> he says that it definitely sounds like a theme song yeah tony showed up super drunk surprise surprise I, I know what wonders never sees so he shows up super drunk and he's so drunk he couldn't play and he just and so he just goes over to 
He said he just reeked of booze and cigarettes and he was just like, hey, I don't think I can play it, but here's how it goes. And he was like, bah, bah, boo, bah, into, into Bernie Marsden's ear. So they recorded it all. And then he just, they said he, he sobered up like way later and was able to just put the piano track on afterwards. But he says he was just like basically just going crash into the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All the comments on this, um, you can find this on YouTube or just all about how it just sounds like kind of like 70s porn music with a guy. Oh, yeah. Mumbling over it. So this is obvious. I'm, I'm not thinking they played this entire thing in uh, every episode, but if anybody remembers um, Scott bringing up, it was probably Moonraker that Roger Moore was filming. So thank you for that. But if anyone, um, the, the thing that I found funny was reading it. It seems like this was a drama. And this is a funny song to have for like a drama. Listen to that bass. I would watch this just for the just for the song. Or you could just listen to the song. Yeah, that's true. It looks like I the label that was released they, on is called Handkerchief. I mean, they could have they could have definitely used this in porn if they didn't. If they if they edited out Tony Ash and. <laughs> 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 I mean, you could. Picture the door opening. A, a woman with a full bush comes walking in. <laughs> <laughs> and greets a gentleman with a full bush as well. <laughs> <laughs> They're getting right to it. There's no no setup. <laughs> and then he says, I'm here to fix your TV. I'm here to fix your telly. Mr. Telly. Arthur Smith says, I can only imagine what the B side of this was. <laughs> because this is like a single. <laughs> Listen to the end. <laughs> okay, that's just fantastic. Um, Blackmore Tights asking oh, if Chaz and Dave are known in the U.S. Not, I don't think at all. I only know of Chaz and Dave through, um, I have actually Chaz's book back over there. It talks about his early days with Blackmore and stuff. Um, I only know about them through the Deep Purple connections, and I, I don't think anyone in the U.S. really knows. But they're pretty big. They kind of, they're a big, uh, U.K. act, um, uh, Ovis and I were talking about them just the other day. He sent me a picture, but I didn't I didn't recognize them um, from the picture. But yeah, I, I don't know. I don't really know much of their music, but the, they were really big in the UK. So and I think they, were, they they did more pop stuff. But, you know, Chaz was, uh, you know, played in bands with Blackmore. He was in the Outlaws. So um, there's the connection there. Uh, so anyway, they did that while they were in the midst of all this. And um I got a bunch more stuff I'll put in the show notes, but it's really interesting. Um, they said that Bernie, like before the show, had a bunch of drinks to prepare. Um, and then, you know, he, he came back looking actually better for some reason. Um, and uh, he's the, uh, at one point, John Lord approached Bernie and was like, hey, can you take over? Because he does, didn't know if Tony Ashton was going to make it. So it could have been like Bernie Marsden singing all this. Um, uh, he could have. Yeah, and he could have. He would have. But it would have been a much different, <laughs> it's a mm, much different feel. Yes. Very um, different vocalists. Yeah, because yeah, if he was like trying to, like, because if if Coverdale for whatever reason had been sick and couldn't do a, a White Snake show, Marsden could have done it, and it would have been like you know the same s relative yeah. style. But for him to be like. Like it, he wouldn't be able to do that. He'd have to put his own. <laughs> the songs would sound totally different, but it would, mm -hmm. I'm sure it would be great. Um, it'd be like that uh, MTV with Oasis, where the the where the, the Liam Gallagher didn't sing. 
he said he was had a sore throat or something, but he didn't know if he's lying. So Noel Gallagher sang, and it was probably the best thing Oasis ever did because <laughs> Liam wasn't <laughs> singing. Um, uh, but anyway, here we go. Um, uh, oh, yeah, before we actually get into that, we should probably um, get through our next round of patrons. And that is, of course, our core level patrons coming in at the $7.77 Keep it warm, Rat Tier. We have Michael Vader. At the $6.99 new nice price tier, we have Spike the Rock Cat and Sugar Tea. At the episode $6.66 tier, we have Steve Coldwell and Arthur Smith. Getting support from the patron, Arthur Smith. Who is on the uh, live stream right now. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Anton Glaving and Charles Meadows. At the $6.65 almost evil tier, we have Kenny Wymore and Michael Bagford and Richie Sucksmith. And at the $5.99 the nice price tier, Robert Smith, Peter from Illinois, and Carl Helberg. At the 60 kroner tier, Scandinavian Knights tier, we have Newt Morton Johansson. At the $5.55 What's Going On Here tier, we have Richard Fusey. And at the $5 Money Lender tier, John Convery, German Heindel, Adrian Hernandez, Jesper Alman, Alexi, The Perfect Stranger, Slepikoff, Kev Roberts, Percival Frequency, Scott Zern, Cynthia Doobie, Raf Kaff, and Coyote Bongwater. <laughs> all right, thank you to all of you for your support. All right, so with that, we go to... The show. This is being performed at the Gr the Golders Green Hippodrome, Hippodrome in London. A musical venue opened in 1913. A looks like uh, 3,000 seats, something like that. Um, I think I read. But anyway, here we go. We're going to start it right up and, and watch the whole show. It's not a, not a super long show, but um, here we go. Good, because I just got an update. Oh, your internet's not going to be back? My network will now be repaired Hello at 2.19 nice p.m. Hello again, everybody. Nice to have you with us for another Radio 1 in concert sight and sound, which, of course, as you all know, means you can listen to us by tuning into the Radio 1 or 2 VHF network whilst uh, enjoying the spectacular in color on BBC <laughs> 2 television. <laughs> the wonders of your technology, so, color. But get yourselves comfy because tonight we have an exciting band for you named after their three founder members who are indeed... Ian Pace, Tony Ashton, and John Lord. Pace, All Ashton, right, here we and go. Lord. Tony Ashton looks like he's dressed for Hughesween. So they're opening up with Ghost Story here. Hopefully everybody can hear that okay. Very cool. <laughs> I love the faces he makes. Looks a little, a little out yeah, of he it. He looks a lot. So he talks a lot about how he felt very uncomfortable, like without his keyboards. It's like miming his walking. <laughs> So now he goes over to the Hammond and does a little solo. The 
solo doesn't come across too much in the audio, unfortunately. Yeah, you gotta really listen for it. And Bernie said he was just, since he was way, way up there, he was just kind of watching Tony the entire show because he was worried he was gonna keel over or something. Scott's asking if the drum rider was high enough. <laughs> He's definitely high up there. Um, so yeah, it looks like this is a 3,000 seater. It was taken over by BBC in the 1960s. And now it's a church. It's a big church. Now that I see that drum rise, oh, it's a mirror. Okay. I thought it was hollow underneath. See, I thought that was just like a four legs he was up on. <laughs> looked dangerous. Until I saw Bernie's legs reflected. Ah, the mezzanine's full. Is Pacey going to the intro of On the Road again, again. So badass. <laughs> he's really, <laughs> he's like squinting into the lights, the stage lights. Bernie on vocals. Thank you, Bernie. I'd be interested to hear Bernie's Tony impression, though. Hearing reports that the video is not that great in, um... How's your that video looking? That is correct. All right, let me, um... I thought it, I thought it was... Your crappy connection. Hot spot. <laughs> I'm gonna prioritize this in the network and see if that helps. Which I got no reaction when I told you that my... Oh, ETA yeah. is now 2.19 p.m. I'm glad we didn't wait for it. They just went ahead by four hours but decided not to change the minutes. <laughs> yeah, the 19 they're sure of. They just don't know what... It's going to be 19 past the hour. We just don't know what hour. <clears throat> All right, device.
<laughs> Scott says we're not stopping this podcast until John's internet is fixed. Like the Jerry Lewis telethon. That'll put the pressure on the ca- <laughs> on John's company to fix it. <laughs> Lord Longford said all US and UK bandwidth needs to be diverted to the DPP live stream. <laughs> Get the government involved. And also being mentioned, if, if Marsden was included in the band name, that could have been Lamp. But it, it did get mentioned, I think we talked about it in our Malice in Wonderland episode, that uh, they talked about Coverdale joining the band, and it would have been called Clap. And it wasn't just a uh, idle speculation, it was actually something they did consider. trumpet solo guy looks like he could be from Ram Jam (laughs) so they got two saxophones a trumpet and a trombone one of the guys on saxophone looks like John Ward's like identical twin I think that's Howie Casey They literally showed every every horn player except the one that looks like John Lord. Hey, John Lord's not at the organ. Did he go up there? (laughs) Is he playing? (laughs) Can he play the sax? Oh, there he is. That was awesome. Yeah, way to bring it home at the end with that. Took me back to when I was a kid um, at school when I used to watch netball practice. And uh, I used to watch these little ladies. Thank you. (laughs) Doing that. Can we do that again? Thank you. And uh, it's about what occurred when I thought I'd pulled the centre forward of the netball team. But she turned up with a couple of big lads like this. I would like it, it's called, it's on our album. (laughs) 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 He told me to say that. For a minute I thought he couldn't think of the name of the album. (laughs) It's on our album, ah, what's it called? He's like the, the, the most awkward front man I've ever seen. It's awesome. Well, that's the thing, is like, you, you think it's just part of his shtick, so. So whether he was like See, drunk, it, nervous, or bold. See the other guy behind the bass player? No, he's, now he's totally behind him, but he looks like John Lord. He looks like John Lord from 1968 on the other saxophone. But Paul Martinez is. I love that the Gardot signed on to the to the live stream and <laughs> until we mentioned his postcard and then he signed off. It was like he was just checking to see if I got it. See him? See him with the saxophone? I said we are playing down the hall tonight. It'd be nice if you made it there. Is the uh, video any better now? Not really. No. Crap. I mean not for me. It seems to be uh oh no, I didn't stop the start the video recording. I said to all my friends. 
Oops. This is something that might lick. So I said to her, Why don't you just come down to the gear? Well, I guess we just won't have this episode on YouTube. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> she came back home after the gig, and the friends came with her too. It was wrong with the great big scar on his face. <laughs> I like any song that begins with Now dig this I mean it's just great <laughs> Listen I agree It does look like he has the lyrics on the floor I'll just start recording it now and see, what, see what happens I remember this song from the Deep Purple Family album CD. Oh, it was on that one? Yeah. I think I really liked it. Oddly enough. Just because, you know, I never... I always talk about how I never really loved Tony Ashton as a singer, but... He said he's been growing I thought this song was very, very cool. Oh, he has definitely these days, yeah. Definitely grown on me. He's just such a character. I mean, it's like... He always keeps looking at the microphone like he's like he like oh <laughs> like, like it's it just shows up and he's like whoa it's like it's like a fly or landed on his nose or something. <laughs> it looks like he just reached over and grabbed something, but there's nothing in his hand. He just like reached over and. You know, so there's there's an audio release of this from. You know, I actually I think that I, I think that this might have been the because um, it was a live it was a live recording. Oh, was that was it? on the the family album. So I feel like it might have been this one because some of Tony Ashton's vocal See inflections the were guy? the same as what I remembered. And um, you know, I, I feel like he wouldn't be the one to like replicate exactly what he did on the album live yeah. like i feel like every performance his vocals would be a little different my bass is tasty that paul martinez is playing
Oh, Lord Longfellow. It might have been a different show then on the on the tour that they recorded the audio from. They're getting a pretty good reception. Mm. It's a number that me and John did, me and him, <laughs> Lord, on an, on, a, on an album called The First of the Big Bands. It's called The Ballad of Mr. Giver. How do you like it? Busting out some first of the big bands. You have to. <laughs> hey, I, I'm sorry I didn't rent my donkey to be here. <laughs> Casey's got a pretty big setup for this show. Speaking, I don't know if they'll know you, but if you listen close enough, I'm sure it's gonna work. The story I'm referring to. So maybe, yeah, really maybe, the, maybe the live 1977 thing they did. They only had five shows, so maybe they recorded all of them and did like a so compilation for that um, live release. this show? I think it was this show. I'm trying to find it in this book. There's two different kind of takes on it, but he had his friend, this, um, this actor come out to introduce the band. Mm -hmm. Ronnie Fraser. I'm sure if the the Brits in the audience know him. He was one of the guys that used to boo Bernie Marsden and he'd take Tony Ashton away. But he came out to introduce them and he had a skull and he was doing like Richard the Third. <laughs> the audience started booing him. So then he just so he started cursing at the audience and swearing Ooh. at them and Yeah, not a not a good way to start. I was I like was saying boo urns. Yeah, exactly. Have like a guy come out and perform Richard the Third before you, before you rock. Ashton was like 55 when he died. What a what a freaking shame. Yeah, jeez.
point, it's like Ashton seems to get the bulk of the um, the solos. Despite playing with John Ward. kind of baseball Martinez it looks like a music it's hard to tell with the lighting but it looks like a music man I didn't think they were they were making them that, that long back Lord wasn't doing much soloing. Scott said he's getting ready for his role in White Snake. It's cold. Due to four aforementioned uh, internet problems, we have lost John, but he'll be right back. Well, I guess he's only got it, the mirror makes it look like he's got more amps than he actually has, but he's got like, three tabs and three heads over there. I don't think it's an eBay style. Uh, with fake uh, tabs there. I think they must have had like 30 heads too. Like I don't know what he's doing with all that. That's crazy. John's back right in time for the climactic close of Ballad of Mr. Gibber. I mean, I get the gist of it. <laughs> they were going on just like a little bit of a repetitive jam anyway. So. Thank you for the oh. Ballad of Mr. Gibber. Lord's Hang taking on, over on Full beard, John. Too. That's that's a right. This is a song. Full beard pace. From yeah. uh, Malice in Wonderland, the album, uh, which is actually in actual fact it's a lie. This song, it's a total lie. It's called "I'm Gonna Stop Drinking." <laughs> <laughs> he just gave, <laughs> but <laughs> gave Tony a little bit of a look there. This might be my favorite song on the album. Despite all the other great rock and funky bits, this is just like such a sad song. I came out this morning. I was really but it got, it's like his hell. cry for help, you know? singing into them <laughs> it's pointed at like his forehead <laughs> Actually thought I was dead. yeah hello Bye. leave me be I'm gonna lay down A lot of scratch things in the song. The longer it lingers, I begin to feel
stupid set placement. Bring bring down the house a little bit for this one. I love how he's like he's always like kind of like moving his hands around and then looking at his hands like he's just discovering them. You know, like, oh, like he's. <laughs> I, I think he kind of is. Like, he just constantly looks surprised by his environment. <laughs> A rare John Lord piano solo. I love it. My favorite John Lord piano solo has got to be from Wizards Convention. Though. It's just so tasty. Why don't you come along and thrust on me? Or if you really want, you can even bust me. Well, it looks like he did um, keep true to his not smoking for the show. Because during Butterfly Ball, he only did one song, but he came up with smoking. And <laughs> he was like smoking and drinking and played the piano. find it on YouTube, a documentary about the making of the album and this with tons of interviews, mostly in the lead case. Really interesting. Brother, stop drinking. I know what you think. Yeah, but you're not gonna. <laughs> didn't make that I didn't can make that one out. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so on the album it just goes Sunday and it like fades out and it's like very sad. But here's like Sunday. Thank you. Now they go into steamroller blues here.
kind of makes you wonder, did they, you know, make the right... Not, I mean, I love Tony Ashton, but... <laughs> should they have had Bernie lead this band? And Tony, with Tony Ashton as, like, backing? I mean, I guess, like, a lot of the subject matter is very... Tony Ashton. Wouldn't have, would have been as interesting. Yeah, I guess that's true. When you stick Tony Ashton out front and it gets very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's very true. And like most people say, I forgot which one of these books, it might have been all of them, just said like, yeah, Tony Ashton's not like, not really a singer, you know, but he, like you said, there's nobody that really performs the way that he does. Right. Create something very unique. John Lord, sax player. I wonder if that's the beast he's playing right there. It must be. The mystery of what's happened to Bernie's guitar collection remains in that. It went off the market, and it just seems like some private buyer might have bought the entire collection rather than buying them individually, but nobody knows who they are. Somebody does. Mm. There's some billionaire fan of White Snake or Bernie Mars. Organ seems much more in front of the mix now. Well, yeah, you can actually hear it. Somebody just posted on um, my my videos, my Ingve Malmsteen videos, are just are, are getting so many views on YouTube. And when, when the guy runs out and puts the pick holder back up, you can see one of the picks falls out. And somebody just commented, Daniel McFarlane, he says, Oh gosh, you dropped a pick. I wonder how many whiplashes that's going to be. <laughs> uh. You know, yeah, Ingve looks over and says, Are you kidding me? Only 11 picks? Ask for a more straightforward blues song than that, but that that was just like that kick ass. James Taylor, eat your heart out. See baby James voice in that one never sounded like that. That of course was Steamroller Blues, and following that scorcher, I think I'd like to introduce the band by name. Shots so fired. Why don't we at start James, up the back uh, Taylor. by uh, naming the driving force behind the band, a very fine drummer up on the uh, podium there. Please let me hear some applause for Ian Pace. And down in the front, one of rock and roll's finest performers, Tony Ashton. <laughs> Next to Tony, one of nature's fine gentlemen, round of applause please for John Lord. <laughs> Up at the back there and on lead guitar, let me hear it please for Bernie Marsden. Mr. Bass at the back. Let's hear it, please, for Paul Martinez. Oh, Martinez, I'm sorry. Martinez. I think I, I also want to introduce the brass players. Let me try and do that for you. We have Gilbert Delanese, Howie Casey. We have uh, a gentleman called Dave Caswell and also Reg Brooks, the brass players. And, of course, 
last but not least, those two uh, delightful young ladies from Edinburgh, two uh, sisters, I believe. They're called Sheila and Jeanette McKinley. <laughs> I believe. <laughs> Check the notes to be sure. There you go. That's the assembled multitude of Pace, Ashton Lord, who continue with another new number, and this one's called Remember the Good Times. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know who the uh, MC is. I don't know if our uh, UK listeners know who that that bearded gentleman is. Mm. This is Dan. Ashton, he's in the foreground. Yeah, he doesn't look like he knows where he is. He's just sitting there. <laughs> like for like 15 full seconds, he was just looking to the side, like blinking. I guess he's just like peacing out during this like part of the he doesn't look like he's even playing, he's just kind of now looks like he's meditating. <laughs> like Bernie in the full white suit though. Good look. It's almost what Glenn was wearing during the California Jam when it started. Yeah, but much to much different effect. <laughs> He's fully clothed at the end. <laughs> Patrons do not recognize the intro guy either, so somebody will have to write in and tell us who, who is that mysterious bearded man. <laughs> Lord Longtree said, I wish I could get as much rest in peace as Tony Ash in the middle of a song on stage. <laughs> Actually, he looked like he was resting more soundly than I did all night last night, as I was supposedly sleeping. Yeah. 
is the first really prominent Lord solo that I think we've seen other than the piano. Oh, it's awesome. You can see his Leslie speaker rotating behind him, that white cabinet. How many cups Tony Ashton has? Lord was waving his hands like in a circle right before this, so I don't know if he wanted them to go on a little longer. Glad he did, because that was a killer solo. When they hit that last note, Tony Ashton doesn't even hit a note. He just, like, kicked the speaker. <laughs> da -da -da. Why don't he timed it perfectly, too? Thank you. Remember the good times. Bless him. This is a, <laughs> the title track. He looks like a deer own. in the head. It's, just, it's a song. <laughs> which, thank you. Which you can put your own... Uh, Interpretations on, or take your interpretations off, I don't mind. It's called Malice in Wonderland. Lord back on the piano. Ashton's kind of wandering around the stage, looking for the bathroom. Yeah, it's that kind of like, like you said earlier, it wouldn't be as interesting. It's like, there's just that volatility with Ashton. You just don't know what, what he's going to do. Yeah. It's like, it's like a little scary. It's like, I, I've seen this before and I'm still like, kind of like, like on edge a little bit. <laughs> like, is he going to make it? Is he going to do it? Is he going to, come on, we know he falls off stage later. We'll talk about that, but not in this show, hopefully. But. Does he have a whistle, a necklace with a whistle on it? The Bernie's moved to a strat now. He's taking off his blazer. Is very interesting. He like, holds the microphone with one hand and plays the piano with the other, the organ with the other hand. I'm sure I mentioned this on our episode we did way back then, but it's just like, this is not what I expect from a song called Malice in Wonderland. 
And especially like we talked about the album cover, <laughs> right? it's so menacing. It looks like such a heavy metal album. And it ends up being this. And that's funky, definitely not what you get. <laughs> funky dual piano, horns, clavinet. left my Worcester postcard lying around. I'm going to go put it in the box. But I've only got one track after this one. One of the best named tracks, which is Sneaky Private Lead. This had to be just an absolutely insane production to put on. The, n- the number of musicians, the, the stage set up. I mean, the, the number of, there's a grand piano, two Hammond organs. Ashton's got some sort of auxiliary keyboard on the top there. Lord's got multiple synths. They're both fiddling around the piano together. They're trading off licks. Nice. Tony. <laughs> oh, now Tony's just taking over the piano altogether. A buddy of mine, uh, who everyone should check out, his name is Yo Horsley. He uh, he was in a dual piano band with his brother, and they're just phenomenal. And they did they do like Flight of the Bumblebee on one piano together, and it's absolutely amazing. Wow. He does he does music for TV now. Yeah, yeah. It's actually a show that my kids watch. <laughs> They got really into the show. I'm like, hey, you know my friend does the music for the show? He also tours all around, mostly in like France and stuff, doing like, he does these like, um, sort of Latin infused versions of like classical music. Pretty cool. Check him out on Spotify. Yo, horse. Oh, he's tipping the organ a bit. Oh, yeah. Oh, and he's using like, some sort of phaser on his synth. Lord's on fire now. Dots invoking the end of the shield. Lord's got like one little box on there with one button. It looks like an old, old, old computer mouse. 
or a white box with one black button on it. I it does. <laughs> I thought Tony actually like, no. <laughs> was resting his head on the piano. Wow, what a jam. Yeah, right? Ooh. Are they going to pretend to go off stage? Or they... Is that a whistle he's wearing? Yeah, it's a whistle. Like a dog whistle? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> he's just turned around. What's he doing? Here he comes. He looks tired and confused. He is. That's true. Who's playing right now? Oh, John Lord. Oh, I didn't see John there. Sneaky private leader. Close it out. It seems like the sound has gotten infinitely better over the course of the show. Like, the engineers are like, ah, oh, we need to actually hear the organ and then turn up the bass a little. Look, I'm looking at the camera. <laughs> doesn't look you made it this far Tony <laughs> he's looking at his fingernails he's like Man, he's really he's really psyching himself up for this one <laughs> Brilliant rhyme. Very Frank Zappa. Doesn't rhyme. You can make it rhyme by tuning it. You can see it. Experiences. It looks like it's almost like he's showing up like for the like he hasn't you know, running the credits. Like he's experiencing it for the first time. Yeah, like he's like he like like these songs weren't written or rehearsed. He's like he looks over at Bernie Mars. He's like, yeah, I am a sneaky private lead. Yeah, yes I am. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he was surprised by the fact that he sang that. You know, it's like that's like part of like what you said that appeal and that that what makes it so interesting is he's. He's just so volatile, and so yeah. And like before, he's like he's getting ready. He's like looking, like looking at his fingernails. And just, he looks like that famous. What's that? That like famous picture of Judy Garland, like where she's like screaming and like holding, like she's holding her hands like this, and she's like 
like it was like 30 seconds before she went on stage and she was like i don't know if she was having like alcohol withdrawal or something but it's like this famous picture of judy garland <laughs> but she, he looks like that where he's just like losing his mind you know the picture i'm talking about probably to everybody's surprise no <laughs> you the resident Judy Garland. Because <laughs> apparently I know everything about Judy Garland. But... According to Rich, you are the Judy Garland expert. <laughs> Just because I know that she was dead or when she died or some shit, I can't what an remember. Expert. Yeah, that, that time that we talked, like, I was like, is she still alive? And you're like, I think she's dead. I'm like, oh, John is such an expert. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but no, I don't know the picture you're talking about. Offhand. I'm trying to look for it now. I can't find it. Interesting that they run the credits and then just keep on going with the show. Yeah, they've done that in a couple of concerts we've seen live before. Where it's like, yeah, let's just get these out of the way. <laughs> we got like five minutes left. Let's just get them out of the way now. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel like, hey, I'm going to try to beat the traffic and leave early, guys. So I'm going to roll the credits. I'll just leave this yeah, rolling exactly. and uh, just can somebody shut off the lights when it's over? <laughs> Alan Black was the announcer. Okay. Good investigative work, Mr. Haskin. Well, it also said it on those credits we just talked about. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was, I'm was. i busy looking for this picture of freaking Judy Garland, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, Scott's mad that you blew his cover. <laughs> He's a disc job. That makes sense. Now I'm thinking I imagined this picture. Yeah, rattling those tubes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I only care about Judy Garland. That's it. Oh, Black died in 2000. He didn't look that old. It doesn't matter. I only care about Judy Garland. He didn't look that old. Almost 50 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I mean, in works. this, like, friggin' Tony Ashton was, like, what, 30? It looks like he was 55 in this. Yeah. He would have died in 2001. He was 55. So. Wow. Look at the size of that venue. It's tiny. That's a yeah, that's... Thousand seats, but well, that's, we got some... that's about as big as where we saw Hughes uh, last weekend. Last week. They had the mezz... Yeah, 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 probably. If they had the mezzanine open. And I mean, really, I mean, that's I would consider that a you know a small venue. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But anyway, there's your... Uh... That was great. Yeah. It was a really good... Uh... Oh, my screen's acting all weird. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to put this one on YouTube. I think it's all messed up. But that's okay. Sorry to our YouTube listeners or watchers or whoever you are. Um, but yeah, fun fun show. Endlessly entertaining. Um, and uh, yeah. that. Uh, so so um, before we get into the closing it out... Um, we, of course, have to thank 
the next level of patrons, which, if you've been listening, is our foundation level patrons. So coming in at the $3.50 deep purple New York tier, we have Lord Longford. At the three pound aromatic feed tier, Simon Ford and Richard Brees. At the $3.33 halfway to evil tier, we have Stephen Sharp and Duncan Leask. At the $3 nobody's perfect tier, we have Peter Gardeau. Ian DeRosier, Mark Roback. Stuart McCord. And then, of course, we have... Flight of the Then Ivan Fjellboo. Runar Siemensen. <laughs> Sorry. JJ Stenard's <laughs> ruinous inadequacies. Is this John just me? Is everything is everything going off time or is this just my horrible connection? It might be your horrible connection. I hope not, but because um, it sounds really it sounds really chaotic right now. Okay. I think it's the normal amount of chaos, but not anymore. Okay. Um, <laughs> Blackmore's tight said, thanks. You made my last two hours at work fly by. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Um, then of course we have uh, uh we have I almost said Tony, John Maselli. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we were doing great. I had to take you to school in a Sherman tank. <laughs> uh, Michael Boyette and Corey Morissette. Then at the $1.71, I want my own tier. Tier, we have Rich, Young, we, Shayla. At the 10 kroner tier, Karsten Lau. And at the $1 made up name tier, we have the. Oh, I didn't do that one. We have the. Um, remember the Dead Times. Uh, Leaky Mausoleum, Stephen Somerville, Concerto 1999, Fanatic, Hank the Tank, Private Eyes, Ashen Lionel, <coughs> Blackmore Tights, Steve Down to Earth, Kohler, Zwopper the Electric Alchemist, Anders Engstrom, and Ashley Still I Hear Burn. Thank you so much to all of you for your support of the Deep Purple Podcast. Sorry, I just started laughing at the absurdity of the Maselli. <laughs> I saw the I saw the Sherman Tank clip and I just started laughing already. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I think it's when Samantha's like, Dad, why don't we move back to New York? He's like, oh, no, you thought our neighborhood was good. I had to drive you to school in a Sherman tank. So um, so after this, obviously, the record, unfortunately, did not chart. Um, their final gig was at the Rainbow Theater in Finsbury Park. Um, that's that's the one. I'm sorry. That's the one where Ronnie Fraser introduced the band with the skull and everybody booed him. And it was just a terrible thing. I guess the band, the, the chip crowd just started chanting, fuck off. <laughs> and somebody called said, get off, you old fucker. <laughs> <laughs> so then he wow. started swearing back at them. And yeah, the good, good way to start the show. Um, so during the show, John started playing Ghost Story and then the lights came up and then Bernie said he was up on that like pedestal that we saw him on and he was looking down and he saw Tony Ashton laying face down in the orchestra pit because he'd fallen off the stage. <laughs> um, but the funny part is that he hadn't even been drunk. He, he hadn't he hadn't had anything to drink before the show. Um, and this <laughs> is the same stage. They said that Frank Zappa did the exact same thing and he was not really a you know, somebody to use substances. So clearly there's something <laughs> wrong with the stage. <laughs> two, two famous people fell off the stage. And I think that's the one where Frank Zappa fell off and he hit his neck. And that's what made his voice so low. Like you said, it dropped at like oh. three full tones. So that's why he had the, such a deep voice after that. I mean, he had a deep voice before that, but it went even deeper. Um, so he wasn't drunk and he just fell back. So they, he eventually like hobbled back on the stage. I think he, I don't know if he broke anything, but they said they gave him some sort of injection for the pain. And then he got through the show. So it was kind of like a doomed sort of tour. And they only ended up doing these, they canceled the German leg of the tour and only ended up doing five shows. Then they went, then funnily enough, it, uh, I think it was Ashton that said, well, that's it for this project. Or it might've been Bernie. I can't remember. And then they got the call and they're like, Hey, we're going back to, 
work on the next album and they were surprised because they're like, okay, it seemed like that was a huge disaster from start to finish. And they went back and they started recording songs for another album. So there's, they recorded about 12 songs. The project got scrapped. They talked about bringing in David Coverdale because he lived nearby. He popped in and talked about the possibility of joining Martin Birch was off producing rainbow in France. And, um, Bernie says he estimates they might have sucked between John Lord and Pace. They might have spent about 250,000 pounds or quarter million pounds on this project before it was eventually um, disbanded. So of the project, John Lord says, I still think that Tony is one of the finest performers Britain has ever had, but he had a nervous breakdown, which is why we had to stop Pace Ashton Lord thing. He was a nervous wreck. He added later, he said, Ian Pace and myself paid the bills, but it was a lot of money. We finished in 1977 and I didn't do anything until 1978. I had a nervous breakdown as well. I sat at home and felt sorry for myself. And the longer you do that, the harder it is to op- walk out that door again. I stopped writing, playing. And he says, hey, listen, it happens to a lot of people. So luckily they all got out of those funks they were in. Um, but it, I'm sure hmm. it had to have been, you know, processing the breakup of Deep Purple and all that had to have worn on them as well. So there you have it. That's uh Pace Ashton Lord, 1977, live from the BBC. Um, so yeah, get a yeah. Uh, Arthur Smith saying he's going to get a copy of the DVD. You should. It's it's a lot of fun. A lot of fun to watch. Um, glad that uh, glad that our UK folks could watch. John and I have the, a rare uh, morning off together, and we do tomorrow. Tomorrow is not a live stream, but we're going to record tomorrow as well. So, assuming they don't push back his internet fix date, so. Yeah, I'll just be like, now it's it's Tuesday at three nineteen a.m. <laughs> it's gonna definitely nineteen past the hour. We know that that much. So. Whatever it is, it'll be nineteen past the hour. Exactly, and you'll be in internet heaven. Well, luckily you're working all night, so hopefully they won't get to it that late. Mm. All right, John. Well. Thank you for watching. Thank you for bearing with us with our technical difficulties. And thank you for bearing with your technical difficulties, John. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Yes, yes. Later. Thank you for listening to the Deep Purple Podcast. If you like what you hear and would like more episodes in the future, please donate on Patreon to support the show. You can also leave us a review in Apple Podcasts to help new people discover the show. You can follow us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for show updates. See deeppurplepodcast.com for more details. Thank you for listening.